started for this session. As you can tell by the little red dot up in the right to left corner. Yeah, I'm going to propose uh, as people continue to trickle in that we fire it up in uh, two more minutes at 9.05 uh, Eastern time, which is 05, probably wherever you are, unless you're in one of those weird time zones. That's just a little. Such as Newfoundland, which is a half hour. It's a half hour time zone, not a full hour. Yeah. There's your useless trivia fact for the day. Well, or India, which is not terribly weird as far as I know. As far as time zones go, it is. A few people that just popped on, we're going to be starting in just about one minute. Hey, Glenn, I think it's uh, good to roll. Shall we do this thing? All right. Well, welcome to uh, the IETF ADD working group, interim session number one for September 10th. Uh, to remind everybody, we have a session uh, today and a session to or next Tuesday on September 15th. Same time, same bat channel. Um, uh, I'm one of your co-chairs, Glenn Dean. I'm from Comcast, NBC Universal. Uh, my other co-chair, I'll let him introduce himself. Dave? Uh, hi, uh, David Lawrence, Tail from Salesforce. Our area director is Barry Leba. Uh, the links there on, you can see are to the data tracker where we're keeping all the documents and the meeting information. The meeting materials are also there available for download. Uh, we have a GitHub, which I provide the link there. And of course, you have found us because you already know the ADD mailing list. Uh, during this session, uh, we will be keeping notes in uh, Etherpad by, through the COMID interface. It's the same thing we use during IETF 108. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute because we are going to need a, a uh, note taker or two. Uh, and Jabber is there at the link. Uh, we will also, if somebody would like to volunteer as a Jabber scribe, it would be very helpful. That's the next slide. Uh, this is, of course, an ITF meeting, so note well does apply, uh, just like it does in a regular ITF meeting. Please be advised. Meeting tips. We are going to be using uh, the WebEx chat queue to manage the uh, speaking queue. So if you want to get in the queue to speak, uh, enter a plus Q there, uh, enter a minus Q there. Uh, please keep uh, general chatter out of that that stream. Uh, instead, use Jabber if you want to talk to the larger group uh, via chat. And uh, today uh, we've covered note well. We'll do a quick agenda bash, uh, and then we'll talk about the, the chairs, uh, review and discuss ADD requirements. The first up will be Chris Box, which will be uh, presenting on uh, the Box ADD requirements draft that has been 
out there and been uh, discussed on the list recently. Uh, then we're going to go switch over to what has been cataloged in GitHub. So we have a, a bunch of issues already that have been opened up. Uh, I imagine that between Chris's uh, uh, presentation, the discussion around it, followed by the GitHub discussion, uh, we will uh, probably consume most of our time. And yes, there will be a bio break uh, between Chris's uh, presentation and going into the GitHub issues. Finally, we're going to talk a little bit about what goes on uh, at the next session and get people's input on, on what they'd like to see and how they'd like to see it formatted. And then the chairs will have a quick close. So before I move on, uh, can we have some volunteers for um, uh, taking notes? Most in particular, we could use one or two uh, or even three volunteers there because it's very important that we get good notes for this meeting. It's not everybody is able to attend. I, I will give you special permission to uh, use the, the WebEx chat to say you'll do it. <laughs> um. Uh, there are 13 people on the document already, so people uh, will at least be watching each other, but we need somebody to step up and um, understand that that's their, their main function is going to be note taking. As I said, it comes with a lot of benefits. You get to put your name up in that uh, into the document as the note taker, and so you can live on in, in posterity. Um, you get to decide the appropriate use of it, it and its. Uh, and and your <laughs> oh Andrew Campley is signed for JavaScript. We still need a note taker though. Ben Schwartz, I can act as note taker. Thank, Thank you, you very ben. much, Ben. Okay, we'll give Ben a minute to get into the thing. Uh, the other thing we'd like to uh, uh, request everybody to do is go into the. Um, the uh, the notepad and as well add your name and your affiliation in there because that's our blue sheet for this interim. So I'll give everybody just a minute to jump in and do that. Can you maybe share that in Jabber or email? Because I think, don't think it was shared before. It's also web channel. Jabber channel. Here, let me go back. Right you, can't, you can't scroll back in the WebEx chat, so please paste it in again. It's also on screen there if you guys want to type it. Uh, it's also available, by the way, if you go to the ADD page on Data Tracker, um, under the media materials, you'll see icons in the top right corner. Uh, they have links to uh, both the Jabber and to the Etherpad through Comid. Right. They, it still says Etherpad, but it's the code. <laughs> Okay, I think everybody's found their way there. Does anybody need any more time to find their way to the notes? Okay. Um, welcome. Let's talk about the agenda. Is there any uh, issues or stuff that people think uh, should be changed or added to this agenda? This is your bashing moment. Okay, hearing none, I'm going to say that we're, oh, Paul Hoffman. Um, so you said that we were only going to deal with GitHub issues. There's a whole bunch of issues on the mailing list that did not get put in GitHub. Um, how are you going to manage? In fact, I think there are more issues on the mailing list than there are in GitHub. How are yeah, no, it's a good question, that? Paul. It, very good question. So, uh, look, we have a lot of issues to work through. So the, the first the first step will be to start working through the GitHub issues uh, because they're pretty well uh, captured as individual items. Uh, and then uh, the other issues that are currently on the mailing list, we'll pull those in uh, probably in session two, uh, because I really don't think with all the issues and the discussion I anticipate we're going to go through today, uh, that we're going to be able to, to get everything done in this one pass, which is why, of course, we have two sessions. Fair enough? Okay. Uh, Let's see here. So, um, we've already covered this part. Uh, Dave, would you, sir, would you like to say anything? Uh, no, you covered the key things already that I wanted to do as far as procedural stuff. So, okay. Uh, let me state, you know, from a 
the overall goal here today is, uh, and unlike when we did the uh, session at 108, where we allowed a lot of people to present new work, and even 107, we talked about a lot of drafts. Uh, the the focus for this interim is really around the requirements. So one of the things that clearly came out of ITF 108, uh, both in the session and also on the list afterwards, was that we have a lot of uh, us, a lot of us are carrying a lot of requirements. Uh, a lot of us are carrying um, things that we have asserted our strong requirements and tried to document them in various places. And so coming out of that, uh, Chris Box very kindly volunteered to start off this uh, draft. Uh, and then I think uh, Tommy Pauly and a few other people started a parallel draft along with the same efforts. And then those two groups got together and uh, f created the, the draft that we're going to sort of walk through today. Uh, but the whole goal at the end of this session uh, and, and as we drag into session number two is really to get the group to a common place and a common understanding around what we think the requirements are. And of course, a lot of this will go on the list. So this is an opportunity to, to uh, bring forth these ideas and discuss them. But we're also going to continue on the list uh, to allow people that aren't in this session today to uh, contribute. So again, here's the tips. Uh, so, um, Chris, I did have, uh, one last thing that I did mean to mention, <laughs> which is that if you're um, sent, uh, please only send video when you're speaking. Uh, that helps some of our our lower bandwidth viewers. And I'll even take his thing and turn my video off. There we go. All right, Chris Box, um, okay. you're up. And let me know when you want your next slide. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the way I propose we go through this um, is Chris has detailed a series of use cases uh, visually that are part of the draft. Uh, what I suggest is let Chris go through the, all the cases one pass through, and then we'll go back to each of the cases and take comments and discussion on them, OK? So one pass, and then we'll have a, an extended discussion from the group. Okay, Chris. Okay. Yours. Um, yeah. So, as as has been said, yeah, this is it's, it's the idea of this slide deck is just to give you a um, a visual overview of what the draft says. Um, hopefully, it'd be helpful. Um, if we go to the next slide, I have to wait for that to go to LA and then come back again. Um, so, yeah, as Glenn was saying, this is um, this, this came out of 108, and my, my impression of the conclusion of 108 was um, there was a need to focus on a smaller set of uh, use cases and 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 just develop solutions for those. So, um, both at the end of that meeting and and in in post list discussion, sorry, post disc post meeting discussion on the list. Um, Essentially, this this structure uh, was formed. Um, so I've put that together. Um, it's maybe a little small to see on the right hand side. Apologies if it is, but it's so the idea is that this is um, it's got a the introduction, of course. Um, terminology we define some terms there, and then section three and four. Um, are the main areas where you find the use cases. So three is all about discovery of associated resolvers, which is you start from what you already know in terms of resolver and go from there. Um, section four is covering something quite different, which is how do you how do you um, address where you have a limited set domain or a limited set of names that are, that are relevant. Um, and then section five, we we develop common privacy and security requirements. Section six um, is intended eventually to, to gather together all the requirements. So in, in each of these, um, there is a table in which um, formal requirements can be stated from the use case text. Um, and then all of those would get gathered up in the requirements summary in section six. So as Glenn was saying, this a lot of the content that is in here um, was from uh, the draft from Tommy Pauly and, and, and other authors. Um, so that that's, yeah, we're grateful for that. Um, but as there, it's still early days for this draft, I would say. There's, there's a lot of 
content still to be written. Um, so the, the initial uh, aim here is to get your feedback on um, are these the right areas to focus on? And th there has already been some comment on that on the list and, and in issues, so uh, we'll come on to that. Now, there, there is, um, Daniel's got uh, submitted a pull request onto the repo, which proposes an alternative. Um, so he's, he's saying um, section three should be discovery of associated resolvers, which it already is. Um, section four, direct discovery of resolvers. And I think, uh, well, he, he should probably uh, describe that himself, but uh, I think he, he wants to look a bit longer term there. Um, and section five is what information should be discovered. Um, but since that's not my proposal, um, although I'm happy to merge it if, if, it's, if it is a good idea, um, but as it's not mine, I, I won't talk about that. Um, so next slide, please. So what I've tried to do with these diagrams is just simplify them um, and just say, hey, Here's the concept, the general concept that this section is talking about. So we've got here, the, um, we're talking about the intro to section three. So this is uh, giving the, what do we mean by an associated resolver? And I've got uh, an end user here who is connected to a network um, and connected to those network, to that network are a number of um, DNS uh, servers. Um, and each of these have got speech bubbles and they're, they're saying a certain thing. That does not mean that they uh, say those things on the wire. It's a, because this is not talking about um, what a solution might be. It's just to give you a sense of what is the role of this thing in the diagram. So here we've got um, this server here is uh, a DO53 resolver that this end user has one way or another um, been configured to use it or has learned by DHCP, for example, that that is their DNS, DNS resolver. So this, this is the status quo. They're already talking to this um, resolver. Um, this resolver happens to be operated by example.com. Um, now, the idea of the association principle here is that somehow, and it may be that the resolver says this on the wire, or it may be some other means. Um, the, the idea is that it says, okay, you've come to me. Um, if you support encrypted DNS, then my, my organization, um, example.com, also runs these other resolvers that you might want to consider. Um, and it's, it's referring to two, three, and four here. So two is uh, another one that says, yeah, I support DOH um, and I have equivalent functionality to your original. Um, alternatively, uh, number three is, yeah, I support DOH and DOT, um, but I also support malware filtering. Um, and number four here is, it's not focused on filtering, but the difference here is saying I've got um, added knowledge of locally relevant names. Um, these are just examples. Don't focus too much on them. Um, the key, there are two key concepts in this section. One is um, an equivalent associated resolver, and the other is um, an alternative associated resolver. And the, the equivalent one is, is probably the the, uh, the more straightforward. Um, so what we're saying with an equivalent one is that it has exactly the same functionality. If you, if you went to, if you sent a particular query to Resolver 1 and you sent it to Query 2, to Resolver 2, you would get the same answer. Um, so that's what we mean by equivalence. Um, this what, number three is not equivalent. That's an alternative because it's serving different answers. Number four, um, we could argue whether it's equivalent or not. I think, strictly speaking, it's not equivalent because it's got um, additional names that it knows about. 
So next slide, please. Yeah, if I could just so, ask everybody who's not uh, speaking, aka Chris, um, please mute yourself. Chris, can you, you can keep on muting them as the chair or the host. Yeah, um, let me give a shot of that. I, I, one, one second, let me see. Okay. Chris, I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay, so right, you meet everyone. All right, so within section three, there are um, various subsections. So here's the first one. Um, this is network provisioned resolvers. So this is, um, here we have an end user in a home and uh, this is the resolver that is uh, given out via DHCP. Um, and this resolver implements functions that are not surprising to anyone. So they are acting as the local uh, resolver for that local network. Um, by some means to be, to be designed, um, there can be a referral or, or somehow a move to a different resolver that is located somewhere in the network um, that supports uh, encrypted DNS of some kind. So here is an example of that, um, a resolver that supports DO, um, it recurses with QNAME manualization, um, it has optional malware filtering, and it has um, network topology knowledge, which means essentially that it is, because of the entity that runs it, it is more aware of um, the structure of this network, um, specifically, you know, what is the connectivity between different parts of the network? Um, what are the latencies? Where are the caches located? Um, that kind of thing. Next slide, please. So this is a subsection of the slide we just covered. So there are two types that we have currently got in the draft. So one is the unencrypted forwarder. Um, and you can guess the, the other one is the encrypted forwarder. So the, the unencrypted forwarder, for whatever reason, cannot support encrypted DNS. Um, but it wants to enable clients to use encrypted DNS. Um, so somehow or another, there needs to be a mechanism where these clients, if they want to, they can move to the associated encrypted resolver, which is here. Um, then I think that's all you need to say there. So if we go on to the next slide, So the encrypted forwarder, um, obviously it's different in the sense that we can take advantage of the locality of that encrypted DNS support. So um, this either out of the box or has been upgraded um, so that it supports some form of encrypted DNS. Um, so it needs to be able to announce that um, to its local clients. Um, if that's DO, it needs to be a URI template, of course. Um, it's not necessarily going to say it has support for MUD, but um, that's uh, one of the advantages that is drawn out in there from in the in the draft from supporting encrypted DNS operation in in that forwarder. Um, in that, because it's close to the devices, it it has yeah. You then have the possibility of. Um, checking the network traffic against that manufacturer usage description. Um, and when one of these devices gets compromised, um, you know, it could then potentially uh, spot that and notify the user. Um, so here, in the, obviously in this use case, um, given that the encrypted DNS support is here, um, kind of expect that the clients will use that, um, but they could um, also use uh, an associated one in the network. Next slide, please. So 
also in section three, um, we have a section talking about what happens when you have a client that is statically configured to use a particular DO53 resolver. So here we have a laptop that's configured to use 11113, um, which is located here. Um, so when either, yeah, at some point as, as the client um, starts that communication, there is a need to learn um, that uh, this, the entity operating this resolver also has an encrypted DNS support. Um, so this is just saying, some, some communication needs to happen that means that the client will learn about an equivalent associated DO resolver or DOT or DOQ or whichever um, protocols are invented. Um, so the client then learns that and then can make use of that support. So this is the encrypted, the equivalent associated encrypted resolver. So by doing this, um, we are saying it's an, it's the same provider auto upgrade. Um, what we don't want it in this case is any offering of alternatives because the expectation is that when the client has specifically configured that, that is the functionality they want. You know, they don't want um, something that's different to that. So the aim is to preserve that same functionality. Um, I just realized I was reusing the mouse to point at things, but I should stop, <laughs> resist the temptation to do that because you won't see it. Um, next slide, please. So VPN resolvers. So this is subtly different. Um, here we have an end user with a laptop and they work for an enterprise and so they want to connect to the enterprise VPN. Um, that VPN concentrator is here. Um, so there are existing protocols that say that that manage that flow and there is some information that is shared when a VPN is set up. <clears throat> so there is a need, well, a desire in, the, in this use case at least to to, as part of that communication to be able to say, um, for your DNS, use this encrypted resolver. Here's, here's, here, are the ident here are the details you need to connect to it. So in this example, we're connecting to, we're saying go to do.example.com, which is this server here. Um, and this resolver is not, is, uh, it has the ability, of course, because it, it knows about the internal names of that enterprise, um, which public resolvers would not. Um, now, you may think, why on earth is that needed? Because all the communication flow in this path here um, is already encrypted with IPsec or whatever it is. Um, these this is um, more of a zero trust model. So it's assuming that this enterprise network is complex, um, you know, that it will be theoretically possible that there is an attacker uh, somewhere in that network. Um, and the more we can do to um, protect this DNS traffic from, from observation or modification, then the, end, the better. Um, so here is such an attacker. Um, they have a foothold in the network, but that doesn't help them um, because they cannot see the, the DNS queries and responses. Next slide, please. Right, so no diagram for this one. Um, so this is the intro to, yeah, what are we talking about when we're saying um, discovery of limited domain resolvers? So discovery, discovering an encrypted resolver for a subset of names um, allows the client to perform spit DNS while maintaining the benefits. So <clears throat> clearly the, the previous enterprise use case is an example of that. 
Um, now, a client could use a public domain resolver that they have chosen for public domains, but use a different um, encrypted resolver for enterprise specific domains. <clears throat> now, in order to enable that, there needs to be some mechanism to provide information about um, which names are supported and what are the capabilities of the encrypted resolvers. So there's a number of subtypes of this. So if we go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this first one is not enterprise, so it's local or home content. So here we, so we're back in the home situation here and the local network forwarder is an unencrypted resolver because it can't be upgraded, but it does refer the user to uh, an associated network resolver, which is which is good in so far as it allows the the end user to use encrypted DNS for public names, you know, all the stuff out here um, on the right hand side. Um, but that isn't as suitable for everything because there are um, domains like home.arpa or .local or whatever that specifically are only valid um, in in that particular home location so if these if these client devices are all sending their queries to server 2 then that would be uh, it would be unable to resolve those locally specific names so <clears throat> So the idea here is that this <clears throat> resolver two is able to communicate some different scope. So if you need these domains, then I can refer you back to resolver one. Um, and obviously all the communication with resolver one will might have to be unencrypted, but at least the functionality is preserved. You can still, um, <clears throat> talk to your speaker or your printer or whatever you need to. Um, so next slide, please. So the second type we've got is locally cached content. So this is generally public content, but it's cached in, uh, in a closer location. So <clears throat> the end user wants the network to be fast. Um, the encrypted DNS resolver that they're using is one um, that is run by the network. Um, and the, the content they're trying to access in this instance is distributed in a number of locations uh, around the world. Um, but server three is not a DNS server, it's, it's a CDN or some content provider server. Um, and that is hosting content in the same city as the end user. <clears throat> now, for some CDNs, that selection is not built on the DS, but for those that it is, you know, that's um, by using um, Resolver 2, it's possible to um, more accurately, well, better select the, the content that the, uh, the location the content we serve from. Next slide, please. And <clears throat> find one is the enterprise one. So this is um, when the client connects to, uh, or this may not be via a VPN, so there may be a direct connection into the enterprise network. Um, but this end user only wants to use the enterprise DNS when necessary. Yeah. For other names, they want to use public resolvers. So um, server two on the picture is the enterprise resolver and it knows about all names ending in something, you know, in this case, corp.example.com. Um, so the cl client knows that for those domains, it needs to go to resolver two. Um, for all the rest, it'll go to resolver three, which is located on the public internet and knows about all public names. Next slide, please. So 
this is different. So this is um, an end user that's saying, I want to limit it how many entities can track where I'm going on the internet. And one of the places that they're going is hosted on a major content provider, um, which is number two in the picture. And the content provider has a way of saying, if you need to look up the address of one of the names that I serve, that I'm responsible for, um, I'll give you the answer directly on my WRA template. And if you do that, no one else will see it. So obviously the content provider knows the IP address of the user, um, but they were going to learn that anyway, presumably because the user would then, once they had learned that address, they would then connect to that address. Next slide, please. So section five covers a set of privacy and security requirements that are generally common. And in, in here, there are a number of things that are said. I've tried to summarize them. Um, clients cannot assume the network doesn't have an attacker. Um, we see that attackers must be prevented from redirecting secure DNS to themselves, from overriding user preferences, from causing clients to use a resolver lacking authenticated delegation, and prevented from influencing discovery to use a resolver not involved with the delivery of the service already. Uh, we say that standards must not place requirements on clients to select particular resolvers. Opportunistic encryption, um, I've possibly over-summarized this because it's not necessarily that it's not recommended, it's that um, there is already a solution for opportunistic encryption. So it's, of course, not a solution for everything, particularly with the security threat model, but that's, um, you can already do that and it's already documented how to do that with DOT. Um, so the position at the moment is this work doesn't need to go further than that, but we'll see. Um, if encrypted DNS fails to work, as will happen quite often. Um, the local client policy needs to decide whether to fail open by just going back to unencrypted DNS, fail closed by generating an error and not, not being able to proceed, or to present a choice to the user. And we say that failing open is generally not recommended, except for cases where it's generated by operating system code, um, so it's not generally expected to be a sensitive query, um, such as captive portal detection. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the last slide. So um, we know there are lots of issues with this, um, but the, the point of um, writing it up is to, is to get your input on that. Um, so please file issues in the repo or comment on the existing ones, um, because we've already got 21 that are open. Um, <clears throat> but obviously having more issues means we get a better review on this. Um, and some of these will need wider debates, um, such as at this meeting and on the list, and some already have. But I think, yeah, we need to go through that process. Um, so just to note that as improvements are made as a result of this, um, yeah, that link will always have the formatted copy of the latest text. Um, and the next revisions will, of course, be published to Data Tracker. So hopefully 01 will be a lot better than 00. So that's it, Glenn. Okay, thanks, Chris. So what I, I propose we now do is I'm going to go back to um, the, um, the earlier slides here. And um, this is a chance for uh, the group to uh, get into the queue, uh, and and, and uh, my co-chair is going to manage that through the um, chat window of um, WebEx. So put the plus Q to join, minus Q to, to uh, jump out. And so the, the goal here is to discuss these various um, proposed use cases. 
And if ultimately we decide these are the, the right set, that's, 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 a, that's a good conclusion. If we decide that there is additional use cases that need to be added, that's also a valid conclusion. It's something we should talk about. Uh, likewise, if, if this is a use case that people feel uh, strongly that isn't needed, uh, let's bring that up and discuss it. So the, the, this is much easier in an open room because you can see faces and you can talk things, you can go to whiteboard, uh, but uh, bear with us. It will be a little slower than being in person, but we'll get there. So uh, please wait for uh, uh, Dave Lawrence to acknowledge you um, and uh, then we can have a little chat. Okay, Dave, I turn it over to you to manage the queue. Yep, and first up is Ecker. Good morning. Um, so I think the predicate question is, what is the status of this draft? Because it appears to be an individual submission. So uh, let me address that one. So it is an individual submission uh, by a number of um, you know participants in the group. Uh, the hope from the chair's perspective is that after we have the discussion here, uh, we also have people give people the ability to look at the notes taken during this meeting and the recording. So a few days for that. Uh, that if there seems to be support for adopting this draft, we'll put it out for a call uh, for working group adoption and see if the group wants to adopt it or not. Okay, um, I, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable, like with us spending a lot of working group time, uh, you know, workshopping something which has no status. But I suppose we can talk about it a little bit. Um, so. Um, this document like badly needs to be broken up into several documents. Um, there are at least, as far as I can tell, three separate um, scenarios contemplated here. Um, the first is the one that got us into this mess, which is um, locally discovering or, or otherwise what resolvers you might use um, as a generic resolver. Um, the second um, is uh, the, the, the case where you have a VPN. Um, and the third is the case where a domain which you're talking to, um, which is to indicate to you that uh, you might use a specific resolver to resolve it or some other domains on, under its purview. Um, so, um, you know, what I think, well, you could just put these as separate, um, you know, uh, 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 subsections of the document, which is to be some easy sort of what's happened here. Um, but I think it actually doesn't work very well in particular because the security requirements and technical solutions are likely to be extremely different. And um, so, I mean, to, 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 not to put a point in it, but, um, you know, uh, the security requirements um, that this document lists, essentially, we do not know how to fulfill in any meaningful way for the case where you're trying to discover what your local resolver is. And yet we do know how to fulfill them in, um, I think, to some extent, for the VPN case and the case where um, uh, the, the case uh, where you're attempting to discover uh, what resolver you use for a specific domain. And so um, we got to deal, and um, more of the signals duties are also probably quite different. So, um, uh, so, so, so I think it's like, uh, you know, really going to be very confusing if we continue to have this uh, this structure because again, uh, um, because it was it just confuses everybody. Else. So I suggest like we um, break this up and se separately workshop each of those cases, and and then um, thoroughly I suggest we try to figure out which of those cases is most important. Great, uh, thank you, Ecker. Paul Hoffman, please. Hi there. So. Um... I'm also very concerned with what Glenn said that let's discuss these use cases. This is not a use case document. This is a requirements document. And it, um, if it was a use case document, that would be easier and longer. And as Ecker said, then we could like separate those out. But mixing requirements and use cases, um, especially disparate use cases, seems like um, a way for this working group to take another year to be able to even start on anything. Um, as we've seen in the discussion on the list about opportunistic encryption for the resolution step, not for the discovery step, um, it's really easy to, to uh, have a requirements document get very confused very quickly. And I think that, and it's also easy for a requirements document to to essentially say, this is going to be one of the requirements and therefore it's going to, you know, like, you know, with, if this is the hardest requirement we have, all solutions must match this and therefore it's gonna go one way. I, I, I think it's fine to have a use case document. I'm not convinced that a requirements document before agreed on individual use cases is useful. Um, and particularly because as Ecker said, some some of the use cases envisioned here 
the requirements would essentially be you need to know what you need to know before you can even know it. And, um, you know, that which is why, like the DHCP working group has existed for decades and stuff like that. So I, I don't want to rat hole on procedure, but I'll discussing this document as use cases um, sort of scares me. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, Daniel Miko. Hi. So um, I, I think I, I kind of agree with um, Eckert that we we might reduce the, the number of use cases, um, um, at least provide an abstract um, description of those. Um, one question I would have to Eckert though is um, why VPN should be a very specific case, use case. Um, because uh, I mean, um, it could be seen as a, um, VPN could be seen as a w just one other way you being provisioned by the network um, a resolver. In some cases, it might be um, a secure way to provision um, compared to DHCP, but um, that's um, that's how I would see the the thing. Um, and actually, I mean, um, this is um, um, I mean, in my PR, I um, I try to. To, to group a little bit of um, all these use cases because um, I, I, at least some of those have, um, there is a huge overlap. So, and I think um, they might be grouped together um, so that uh, requirements can be deduced from, from those. So that's, um, that's my comment. Thanks. Um, Andrew, oh, actually Ecker jumped again. Sure. So, I mean, this question of the VPN, I think Martin actually argued to me separately that the VPN was like local discovery. I think it's unlike local discovery as a practical matter, though perhaps like it um, in concept. And the reason I like it in a practical matter is you already have an authenticated connection with VPN provider. And so um, and so you might be willing to listen to certain things it says. Um, so technological is actually extremely different. Um, so we, I mean, in fact, we already have a te technology for this um, where IPsec VPNs are allowed to tell you um, about their, uh, you know, their DNS provider and allowed to override your DNSSEC routes, in fact. Um, and so um, and so as a practical matter, um, it, it's quite different, even if in theory it seems quite similar. Um, I say, uh, you know, the, the, the problems around the local provisioning all, all involve, like, you know, the fact that you're going to have to listen to DHCP or DNS or a bunch of things you don't trust. And that's not true in this case. We already have a secure channel to talk to them. Thank you, Ecker. Andrew Kampling from Jabra, please. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to call out uh, one of the comments on, on Jabra on the status uh, of the uh, draft, um, which is that uh, um, I'll read this out verbatim. Um, as to the status of, the, of this draft, the work group chairs, having written it, probably should have just made it a working group document by fiat and then had a discussion about what the content should be. Um, and a second comment, which is, it, it seems to be better to keep this as a single document and hold off on splitting it up until later, as I suspect there may be a need to refactor as it evolves. Okay, and I'll take chair prerogative to jump in with uh, two different things. One, that first comment was actually from Michael Richardson, and then the second one about the single document was from Eric Nigren. And to be clear, neither Glenn nor I has been a co-author or contributor to this draft. So um, that first comment was uh, at a slight <laughs> a factual problem in um, independent of whether declaring something by fiat would ever be a good idea, which in this group, I think would be a particularly terrible idea. Um, it, it's, it's not our draft anyway. Um, and thank you. Did you have more then, Andrew? Or okay, Martin Thompson, please. So just responding to Becker, I think that the reason that I tend to glom VPNs together with with local discovery is that there are some network conditions under which you can uh, trust, or you do have authentication for the configuration that you receive. So there's the attitude dot eleven x and and things like that. So I. I Functionally, I think they they could go into the same place. I don't think it's a point worth debating at length, though. I I don't much mind as long as we we properly address the unsecured network scenario. I think we'll, we'll get a long way. 
And uh, to that point, I think that's the only thing we should start with if we're going to talk about splitting use cases out. Um, Paul, back to the queue, please. Uh, this is actually a question from Martin. When you said that that is the only thing, can you be specific? Yeah, so that the case where you join a network that you have no relationship with and you receive configuration from that network that you cannot authenticate. Excellent, thanks. And plus one, two, two, that being the focus. That actually uh, has brought us to the end of the, oh, no, I'm sorry, Ralph has uh, joined. Yes, Ralph. Um, yes, I mean, plus one, two, I mean, focus on the discovery, I think, of associate resolvers, the three things. On uh, the limited domain resolvers, uh, um, 0.4.2, uh, where is encrypted resolvers for content providers, even though I'm working for one, I think this, uh, models the uh, uh, the ground in DNS uh, speak where we normally have resolvers or maybe forwarders and then the authoritative side. This is something in between and I believe long-term operational wise this will uh, make things harder for people to uh, use and debug DNS so I'm sort of uh, opposed this. Thank you, Ralph. I want to observe that we're actually, Andrew has offered um, to bring some more comments from Jabber, but I think it's kind of up to the people that are chatting in Jabber if they want their comments at the moment and want them passed through, Andrew, to please raise that. Um, I will ask, though, since we have the presentation, is there anything in particular about any of these slides that people uh, want to address specifically rather than kind of the the meta questions and the more general questions, uh, or should we be moving on to um, discussing issues and so on? I had my hand raised in WebEx. I don't know if I'm in the queue. Uh, I don't see the hand raising things. Use the plus Q, minus Q, please. The list of participants is too long. So please, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. so um, <laughs> I'm Vinny Parla from Cisco and uh, VPN use case actually is a use case where a uh, resolver is mandated by the network. And Ecker even noted uh, correctly that VPN can override user preference. Um, there is another use case, which is guest Wi-Fi networks where, uh, and this is very uh, common in the educational sector, where they have to do content filtering by mandate. And I think that use case needs to at least be considered. It's very similar to VPN in that, that in that scenario, you're overriding uh, user choice. So I just wanted to raise that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vinny. And I, oh, Tom Pauly. Hello, yeah, just to respond to that. Um, I don't think I would view a VPN as avoiding a user choice. Um, you know, like on a normal client operating system, there is a choice or at least an acknowledgement that you have a VPN installed and you can have it on or off. Um, you know, maybe it's part of a profile or something that your enterprise tells you to use in order to also get access to other things. Um, but I don't think we should see this as ever overriding what the user is able to do because they always have the option to not use that. And then similarly, I think on the Wi-Fi network that I join, of course, the network may try to block me or do anything if I am not using the resolver it chooses, but I do not think we should be talking about anything here that would allow a network to override what the operating system would otherwise do. You can say what the network wants to use, but it should not override a strict user preference. But there's no way to convey that in the guest Wi-Fi network. 
unlike a VPN where the user you can convey that in a guest Wi-Fi network use case, there's no way to convey that to the user. That that's so I think all the network has to do is convey what resolver it uses. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Tommy and Vinny again. Paul, uh, Tommy, I, what when you said that you know VPNs start at like the operating system, that's completely wrong. A lot of VPNs in many organizations are actually done pretty much at the router. I mean, that's where they started. Sure, so, sure. Okay, so exclusive or including things. And, and I, I mean, I think this gets closer to one of the problems that a lot of us are having in the working group and certainly with this document, which is that people assume that choices are made at this place and they make wildly different, th their finger is pointing at different places. Um, I, I can totally understand, Tommy, why your place is the operating system. I can mm -hmm. totally understand why Ecker's place is an application. Um, and I would, and this, to me, this is why breaking up the document or at least starting on one use case that can be well-defined instead of mixing, um, requirements across a lot of them would actually help us move forwards more quickly. Great. All right. Thank you, Paul. Tommy Jensen, please. Thank you. So just to call out um, some nuance there brought up by Vinny and Tommy. Um, today, as far as I'm aware, there is no concept of a network mandating a DNS server. It recommends, but it can't mandate. And I don't, and I see how that's a problem worth solving, but I don't think that that problem should be specific to this working group because a network mandating a policy is bigger than DNS. And I, like I said, I see, I'm not saying the problem is not worth solving because the use cases are pretty clear, but to say that would be a novel concept. Yeah, the only reason I'll disagree with you here is that when it was clear text, the network could see all of the DNS requests and alter and enforce whatever policies it wanted on those DNS requests. So, uh, in a sense, the network had full control of the DNS at that point. Sure, but that's a side effect of it being unencrypted. I don't think that that implies any encrypted solution maintain that functionality any more than encrypting HTTP requires that a network can continue to monitor that content either. Like we need a new, we need a network level mechanism that allows a network to in an authenticated manner, communicate to clients that is separate from a possible attacker. Um, DNS is only one function, say, for example, of a DHCP server. So as long as those can be mimicked by an attacker, um, that's all fair game, right? So like I said, it would be a novel concept. Even though a network could attack the traffic um, before when it was unencrypted, that doesn't mean that the network was enforcing a policy to the client point of view. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Tommy. I, I'm aware of the fact that uh, Martin is increasingly um, concerned about venturing into policy territory here. So, Martin, you want to add yourself to the queue. Could you also then uh, please address that at the mic about which specific areas you are concerned about in this discussion? Um, but the next up in the queue right now is Glenn, who I think will probably be clarifying whether he's speaking on his own behalf. Yeah, so in this case, I am speaking on my behalf, not as a chair. Um, I want to make a comment about the VPN aspect. So, you know, VPNs, when they technically take over, I've always viewed it as a bit of a, they take over my environment when I run them. You know, uh, from a corporate perspective, they often on my machine will, in fact, dictate my VPN choice, or so my DNS choice while running the VPN. And they'll override whatever settings that I may have configured. And so I wonder if we might have a, 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 a case here where we'll have a conflict between the behavior the VPN is trying to enforce as a security policy on the computer and um, the ability for 
uh, applications or, or user settings outside of what the VPN itself can see, um, overriding that or changing that. And so I'm not trying to drift into policy space of, you know, you know who, that I'm just raising up that we have a potential conflict in technical behaviors between the behavior that the VPN will expect from the DNS and the behavior that uh, applications may uh, create uh, that is different in the DNS they choose to use. That's my comment as a non-chair. Thank you, Glenn. Andrew Campling, please. Hi, uh, and again, this is me speaking for myself, not for the Jabba Q. Um, two points. Firstly, um, on the, 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 the whole thing about so uh, user selection, oh, sorry, uh, resolver selection, we seemed to be straying very clearly into uh, uh, talking about p possible policies uh, for prioritizing um, selection choices, which, which feels like that's out of scope for the charter. Um, and also, um, when we're talking about users, just to reflect a comment I made on the uh, sort of j j Jabber list, um, RFC 8890 helpfully uses the phrase indirect users to distinguish between the person at the device um, and in some cases the device owner, such as the parent or enterprise. Uh, and I think that might be helpful terminology uh, just so that we a clear which type of user we mean uh, in discussions. But in either case, I think we should steer clear of policy stuff, uh, if possible. And speaking as, as a chair now, Glenn here, um, we, we will, <laughs> we have, uh, we will we'll continue to monitor when, when these conversations do strain of policy and we'll try to pull you guys back uh, because we are, that's clearly out of scope. Um, yes, and I will observe that Ecker, having removed himself from the queue again, was actually the, the last of the queue uh, moment. There are, have been some interesting conversations going on in Jabber, too, and it's kind of a shame Mr. Richardson has not brought some of his observations to the mic. Oh, Chris is back. Um, so given that, uh, yes, please, please, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to respond to Andrew. Um, so. I disagree with him on one point, which is uh, 8890. I don't think indirect users are intended to apply to enterprises. Um, parents, yes. Uh, enterprises, no. But that's just my interpretation. And Martin, please. So it seems like we managed to get somewhere in this discussion, and it would be good if we could maybe formalize some of the conclusions from it. Um, did we make any conclusion on the separation of requirements into, into multiple documents? And did we make any headway on deciding which of those requirements to take on first? So I, I'm not sure it's it, we're ready to uh, Say that we've reached a conclusion, at least as a chair, I, I'm not necessarily hearing consensus. But although it's, uh, to be fair, it's very tough to judge all over WebEx. <laughs> so um, the wh what I would like to suggest is that we let this uh, proposal, um, and I don't mean Chris's proposal, I mean the proposals to split uh, that you raised, Martin. They're, they're, good, they're good, good questions. We need to ultimately take those to the list, have a discussion there and see if there's consensus around that approach or not. Yeah, cool. OK. OK, Ecker, please. Yeah, um, so I think that actually uh, has things in the opposite order. Um, this is not a working group document, as I observed at the beginning. So proposals do not need to get consensus. What needs to get consensus is this is document for anything. So, um, so like the presumption that this is the piece of material and has to get consensus for changes is wrong. The, que the question is, is it, whatever we has to accept it needs to have consensus to be accepted. So um, I, I think that that's the right way to ask this question, not the way you asked it. And Paul, please. Oh, plus one to what Ecker just said. Um, there's 
two ways we can go forwards with the thought of maybe having more limited uh, requirements. One is to take the current document and either pick it apart or do a major revision. And a different one is that some someone simply writes a second set, you know, requirement or whatever um, using some of the ideas from this document, um, uh, where some is a subset and moves forwards that way. Um, I am not volunteering to do that because in fact, I, my, I, I don't believe that the things that I'm interested in are in the majority of what folks here are. But um, I could easily imagine a two page, you know, doesn't even need to be an internet draft, but a two page description that says um, for this specific use case and other ones that we're not talking about here, but here, here's a use case. Here are the requirements that seem to be the hardest <laughs> and then go from there. Great, uh, we have once again reached the current end of the queue. Um, there is a little bit of chatter going on in Jabber that I'm wondering if it's gonna make its way this way. It doesn't look like anybody is inclined to bring it here, although, um, well, I'll, I'll mention it because I think this is uh, an interesting point of discussion, but uh, it's Ecker's suggestion in Jabber. It seems like a good way to address uh, these points would be to create a separate requirement document which just covers the local discovery thing. Does anybody have feeling pro or con against it? Andrew is joining the queue. Uh, yeah, as I commented on, on on Jabber, I can't really see what difference it makes in having a separate document rather than sections within a single document, other than it just makes it effective to put comments between multiple requirements documents rather than one. Um, I might be missing something, but I fail to see the advantage of cutting into lots of little documents. Okay, okay. Martin, please. Yeah, so looking at the, the state of the document at the moment um, that, we're, that we have in front of us, uh, section four is not in a very good shape. And in fact, there's a lot of stuff in there that just templates and, and stubs. If section four were to be removed, the remaining sections are a lot more complete. And I think it achieves Ecker's goals. So just putting that out there. Great, thank you, Martin. And now Paul. Uh, to answer Andrew's question, um, the, larger the, the larger the document and the, the more possible requirements that somebody, you know, or use cases that somebody has, the much harder not only will it be for this working group or any working group to come to consensus, it also will, um, the requirements document is going to tilt towards a single solution. Um, and what we've seen so far, just in general chatter on the mailing list, is it's not clear that every use case needs to have the same solution. It'd be lovely if it does, but so far we aren't seeing that. So um, I still think that a much narrower, possibly a single use case document that people can say, can argue against. Sure, it might get coalesced into a larger one later, but um, if we wanna make progress in the next few years, I believe that um, having a narrow, narrow scope will help this working group say, yes, this goes to that requirement. Thank you, Paul. Ecker, please. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so, I'm saying back, Martin suggested, I think that we should part that. So I think, I mean, first of all, I guess if people agree with me that these cases are different, then like that's useful information. Um, I mean, Martin suggested that we work one set of use cases first. And so the reason I think to split the document is so we can work that set of use cases. And so we don't have to, uh, um, and so we don't have to spend a lot of time refining the use cases that we're not working first. Um, so, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps if people, if people really have concerns about the document, perhaps we can start there and ask, should we work one set of use cases first? And so what's your state being? Great. Thank you, Ecker. Michael Richardson. 
Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so um, I um, I feel that it is important to have. Um, I think it's more interesting to have a well understood and agreed upon set of use cases than it is to have a set of requirements on uh, a solution. And so um, if we were to do anything, I would say that uh, this document became a set of use cases um, that would make me happier. I, I think that Paul's notion and Ecker's notion of some amount of splitting or focusing is reasonable. Um, but at the same time, I think that some of the, uh, some of the things where people are like, well, I don't know if the solution accommodates both uh, use cases or not. Um, I think it may be a bit fluid back and forth. So I don't really care if we have one document or four documents that describe use cases and some of them don't get solved. Um, I, I don't feel strongly that way. Um, what I would suggest, um, having been through a couple of use case requirement things in the last year um, in RATS, what I would suggest is that the question sh that the working group members should ask is not, do I love this document? What I, what I think they should ask um, when they think about adopting it is, do I believe that these editors and authors are responsive and useful and will do go the direction that the working group tells them? Um, um, and I think that's the ultimate question because, uh, you know, we can have all sorts of stuff in there. And I think the question is, do we trust these people to do the right job? Great. Uh, thank you, Michael. Peru, please. Hey, uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the requirements draft, right, I see uh, we have listed several use cases, but the one that seems to be a bigger pain point for the working group is the one where there is no pre-existing relationship with the network. And uh, uh, in those cases where the discovery happens, we want to make sure uh, we protect the endpoint from connecting to an attacker's uh, encrypted server. So that seems to be uh, uh, one of the main uh, uh, discussions that seems to be happening with regard to how do you protect the endpoint in those cases when uh, it wants to use the network provided server and there is no pre-existing relationship. VPN is, is a very probably a very straightforward mechanism because uh, there is a mutual auth that happens between the uh, VPN client and the VPN server and uh, the DNS server can be securely provisioned. But the other use cases where uh, the secure discovery is not possible is the one that probably needs more discussion and uh, 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 a, a list of all the requirements that would be possible and the threat vectors that are possible and more focus on that, how to achieve uh, a discovery in a way that uh, attack vectors can be reduced. Great. Uh, thank you, Tiran. Asanjay Mishra, please. Oh, yes. Um, so the one, one comment I have, and it kind of builds up on what I'm, I heard from Ecker and also from Paul, I think it might be easier if there's a focus on on a use case which is kind of understood well, um, not that the other cases are not, but it's just easier to focus on on a single issue. So, for example, discovery of a local resolver. If there's a document that sort of really focuses on that, um, then that would be a good start to get this group started on something. Um, the and as Ecker was pointing out, that not all requirements apply in the same same manner. You know, so you've got the enterprise use case, you've got the VPN, which may be slightly different, and the security issues would also be different. So it might be just easier to focus on something that is understood uh, and, and is a very basic premise that how do you discover your local resolver and how do you ensure that the the user is getting the intended resolver that the user wanted to reach out to. So I think. It may be easier to focus on that, and then um, whether you write multiple documents or you eventually add additional requirements that can be decided later. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sanjay. Tommy Pauly, please. Yep. Uh, so, responding to the past couple comments and what Ecker was saying, I think right, we could have the sections three and four certainly be split. I think it'd be interesting to at least keep some form of them in parallel, even if we try to focus on one set first. And to people's point of focusing on the, the local network one, while I think that is the case that is the most similar to what 
we do today with unencrypted DNS very often with DHCP. It's also the the hardest you know to figure out you know will we have an actual path to making this truly a trusted mechanism something that we're happy with the security properties of doing things for VPNs or where we have a trust relationship there doing it for a domain that we have a trust relationship with those ones that may have clearer easier paths to having um, mechanisms that have security properties that we like. So I think if we do want to, I think there's more to work on for requirements for the local unencrypted, unencrypted network or untrusted network. And how do we bootstrap that into something that is encrypted for DNS? I don't think we should only look at that and not define mechanisms for the other things because those other ones will probably have a quicker path to actually having concrete mechanisms. Okay, uh, thank you, Tommy. Mohammed Med, please. Um, um, that, that, that will be uh, really quick. It's, it's. Um, I fully agree with what what just Tommy said right now. So I, I think it's, it's, it's really good to have a set of use cases and clear use cases for the people to um, to refer to, so that we we will speak the same language and we will be referring to the same use cases. So. I think as the the authors have done, I would say the good job to um, to try to list all the I would say the um, the most promising use cases and the, those that are of interest of this working group. So I think that's 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 a good job. We we um, we um, um, we may prioritize the one that will be I would say the one that will be targeted by the working group. But this is um, for me another exercise. So it's up to us as a working group together to decide whether we want to um, to target only all of them or only a subset. But for sure, this, this this document as currently right now, I think it's it's really a good starting point for the working group. At least, it 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 gave us a common place so that the working group can talk together instead of talking about the individual solution that we are, I would say, trying to um, to to, uh, to to socialize within the working group. So this is the first point. The second point is that is is that. Um, uh, there, there, I would say uh, for the uh, the VPN use cases and similar ones, that's really the the, the one that are I would say more straightforward to to solve. We have we have already I, uh, extension that can be I would say um, easily uh, tweaked to uh, to address the problem. That's that's mean that it's not because it's simple that we have to put them aside. So. Um, we, we have to figure out how we can, I would say, um, uh, find um, a subset of the use cases that we, we will target, covering both the, um, I would say, the insecure and the, the secure one. But for sure, keeping this working group as a, as a starting point uh, with something that I would personally recommend to pursue by the working group. Okay, thank you, Mohammed. Paul Hartman, please. So I strongly disagree with uh, what Tommy and Mohammed just said. I don't think that um, having a large list um, and uh, letting folks do the easy ones is actually going to help much. It, it's very clear that where the juice is and where the highest need is, is in the hard one, which is you've got an unauthenticated network um, or you've, ma you've made unauthenticated choices and now you want, you want to upgrade. Um, so, uh, I don't, you know, like, I, I really do believe that um, the easy ones are, in fact, trivial and probably best done outside of this group, such as, how are we going to do this in IPsec? Let the IPsec ME working group do that. Um, I, really, the hard ones are very hard, and, and I think that that's where we should be doing the work. Thank you, Paul. And I will note that the queue is closed now because we're going to be taking a quick break. But I also dropped a note into the Cody to Ben just to see if he wanted to say anything because he has been heroically keeping up with all of your comments. And I don't, and I know he often likes to also participate. So I just want to make sure that he gets a chance to speak. Thanks, David. This is Ben Schwartz. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really had time to to formulate a, a comment, but I just uh, want to thank everybody for uh, for engaging in a, a lively substantive debate here. Uh, I'm I'm glad that we are getting this conversation. And can I make the observation that I've been following Ben's notes as he's been taking them? Wow, you're you are a master at note taking, sir. 
Well done. Okay, so um, we were thinking 10 minutes, but if we round it up to an even uh, 25 minutes before the hour, we'll get going again. Thank you. Don't around texture like sun Lays me down with my matching eyes Thank <laughs> you. 
Alexa, stop.
Sim. And are you on audio? I am now. Ah, I go ahead. Um, are you aware there is a number 26 issue as well, which... What is there? Yes. Becca raised. Um, and it's it's from the discussions, or, or at least is timely with the discussions we just had. Yep, no, no, my bad. I uh, grabbed them out of the uh, lovely feed that was in the um, uh, the, the uh, Etherpad, and I uh, admit that I missed a, a line. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that to my attention, Chris. I'll, I'll update this live right okay. now. We're not going to get to number 26. Well, if we do these in order, we, we might do these in a different order. Yeah. Because I, I was thinking 26 is probably the first one we should talk about. <laughs> I've been uh, talking into a mute mic, and it's funny because the first couple of times that somebody said something, it seemed to be in response to me. Anyway, we are um, getting moving again, and I was just going to say to Glenn that, uh, yes, I saw your private message, and you're right. We don't have to take these in order, so I think your suggestion is fine, and I um, hand it to you to get us going again, Glenn. All right, just one second. I'm updating the slide. So we have issue number 26 in our list. I think back to the early days of my career and how it would take you um, days to have the, the art department produce new slides and produce them and then copy them over. And here I'm doing it in seconds <laughs> on my computer. It's pretty amazing. We've come a long way. What was that? And there we have through the magic of computers, issue number 26 in our published list. Okay, why did that pop up? You know thumbnails. <laughs> so I just have a question regarding the way of working um, with GitHub. I mean, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear oh, you. Okay, good. Um, because I thought that the easiest way was to, to provide some PR rather than um, um, raising some issues. But uh, I'm just wondering uh, what's the, the experience over that. Chris, you've been the one deeply in invested in this particular document. Do you want to comment on what's working best for you? Um, I would probably prefer to hear from people who have um, perhaps been more involved in GitHub. And, and there is... Um, there's an RFC on on how is it best recommended to use GitHub, and there are a number of modes in there that a working group can adopt. Um, my preference is for the more advanced one, which is where issues um, are um, actively worked on in GitHub, um, because I, I personally I find that that's easier to deal with than than having a lot of email traffic on the list, but. Um, mm. Yeah, looking for other views as well. 
Um, and for those who aren't aware, that there is a couple of documents. So I wrote a document and published it out to um, our working group's uh, uh, Git repository. Uh, so sort of try to introduce this and and the, in looking at the best practices of uh, what the ITF published and also what other groups seem to be doing very successfully is it seems to be that that keeping things as issues that are very focused uh, with uh, sort of atomic outcomes like it's done or it's not done um, works well for capturing core core issues and core ideas um, whereas the the pull requests when you want to get in there and start mucking about it you know, really have some fun uh, changing things around. Uh, that seems to be uh, a tool that I've seen, you know, because I, I'm not an author in this document, but I've been watching this because it's one of the great things with GitHub is you can watch these things uh, and, and subscribe to them. And as I've seen uh, Tommy uh, and and Chris and, and other people uh, work on the draft we just went through, um, through the GitHub, it's really interesting to see the pull requests and how uh, individual elements in the pull request can be commented on and debated uh, and that's captured and you can watch that play out as an observer, uh, which is very useful to understand where the authors were coming from and why they made certain decisions. Okay, so yeah. um, let's let's get to it. Is everybody back? If anybody's not back, raise your hand. Um, hopefully you've had your chance to uh, use some facilities and maybe even refill your cup of coffee. Uh, if it's morning time for you or whatever it is, your uh, beverage is keeping you going wherever you are in the world. Um, so this is the list of issues and, and they're currently sorted by the date that they came in by with the oldest issue being at the very top of the thing. Um, I'm going to propose that we uh, actually uh, don't take these in order. Uh, that we, in fact, go through a, di a different path through this. And I think judging by the discussion we just had and judging by what I see going on on um, Jabber, uh, two issues that really seem to be popping up um, are uh, number 26, which is really should be two documents as, as originally put in by Ecker. Uh, and then the other one is around authentication. So we have uh, two issues here, in fact, uh, uh, that call out authentication uh, already. We have uh, number 18 uh, and number eight. Uh, which uh, I think both are, are very similar. Uh, one is I actually um, I started the, the, the one on what is meant by authenticated because uh, as chair I've heard the authentication discussed a lot uh, across uh, the mailing list uh, for quite a while now and even at microphones and it, it occurred to me that we as a group I have not heard what I would consider a, uh, a consistent definition of what is meant by authenticated when we talk about that in these contexts. Uh, and so uh, I opened that up as a, as a thing for the, the authors to sort of address around this group or around this, this topic as they're writing about it. But I think it's a good thing for us to have a conversation about it. So I'm going to propose, unless we have anybody who really feels strongly, let's talk about number 26 first, and then let's move on and talk about uh, number eight and number 18, which really are very similar. Does that sound like a good plan for everybody? Anybody violently opposed to that? Okay. So let's talk about number 26. Of the, so this really should be two documents. Um, th this is meant to be, this is not a, a presentation mode. This is an interactive discussion mode. So uh, let's use the, the queue um, and I'll hand it over to my co-chair for managing that. So should this really be two documents? Glenn, to just a point of um, the way that we work this, could could we put the issue on screen? Do you have, could you do that? Um, oh man, you're asking for fancy stuff. Give me a second. <laughs> okay. But yes, I think I can pull that one off. Then um, Martin's just posted the URL for that in the chat. So I think if we could just move to the discussion. Yeah, well, um, one second. Give me. We, we don't have to wait for, I, I, for you, again. Glenn. Okay. I'm sorry. I was muted. <laughs> My bad. I, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now I'm unmuted for managing the queue. But uh, the one thing I wanted to observe 
was that, yes, Glenn and I will get better at this. We've seen it work effectively in HTTPS and quick, and we know that the queue, um, the issues this way is an effective way to work. And sorry, we were not on top of that. And now Martin is uh, ready to go from the queue, please. Yeah, so I, I think what Echo managed to identify in this was that there was um, the local network discovery aspects of this, and that there's, there's a number of angles on that one where, where we have to deal with forwarders and networks without forwarders and networks that we can authenticate in some way, wave hands, um, and VPNs and, and all that sort of thing. And those might fall into it into a single document, but um, the content provider use case was one that was very much distinct. And some of the limited domain stuff was unclear, but seemed separate as well. And so the, the first put that I think we're discussing here um, at least my put is take section four out into a separate document and concentrate on just what's in section three and maybe enhance that with some of the things from from section four that that maybe maybe shouldn't have got it, gone out in the first place and try to narrow it there. Great, thank you. It any other comments? Okay, thank you, Paul Hoffman. Please. This would be to limit it even further, um, which is to um, have the single use case of uh, with the that you got your um, your current resolver address in a in an un, uh, in an unauthenticated fashion. Um, I think, it, and and. I know I'm picking the hardest one first, but I think it's the one that is has the most juice to it. Um, so if that's too hard, then I think it's reasonable to say to to make you know the first one we work on. Uh, you got your your resolver um, address in a authenticated way, but I I also don't think that I think that happens so rarely that it it actually that the solution there will not be so interesting. Thank you, Paul. Ecker, with this being your issue. Uh, okay, well, we have more in the queue now. Can you Paulie, please? Yeah, um, you know, as I think the points that Martin and Paul are making make a lot of sense. Um, definitely the local case is the hardest, but it's also one that's going to be interesting to talk about in depth. One point just to kind of elaborate on what's in section four for the split use case that may be relevant when we're talking about local networks is, you know, if, if we are in a world where we have an application or an OS using some public resolver more broadly, um, just using quad eight or quad one because of user choice or something else, Knowing that or having some provisioning for um, which domains are going to be local breakout um, seems uh, very important to kind of make those use cases work well. So another way to spin it would be to have a focus of a requirements document on what the what a local network needs to do um, for both kind of its provisioning of what does it have as its encrypted resolver as well as its um, split domains, if that's useful. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, Danielle, please. So, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I understood the initial question as, um, from one document that uh, mix use cases and requirements, should we have one or two documents? And the sense I got from the response is that we 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 saw sort, sort of are uh, uh, aiming at having a uh, one requirement document per use case. So I'm just um, um, I I understand that we have a hard use case. Um, but I think it's it's also important that we have a global 
picture um, of all the requirements. And um, I'm not too kind of uh, splitting um, those use cases. Um, um, I don't mind that we have a one use cases document, requirements document, but um, I think focusing on only one use cases, um, we may miss uh, something in the big picture. So, I mean, that's um, just my opinion. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Paul, please. I uh, definitely want to agree with Tommy on the, if we are, if we pick the use case that is, um, you know, uh, the local one where you got the address um, in an unauthenticated fashion, there are still other things that relate to DNS resolution that you would want to know, such as, you know, does the resolver handle local things correctly? And some of the questions of, are there multiple resolvers that do different things? So I, I think that that part is just fine for us to do. Great, uh, thank you, Paul. Ecker. Sorry, I actually, I actually thought I was behind Martin. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I guess uh, I would, um, uh, again, I sort of like, think it's a little weird that we're talking about this as if we're like, editing a working group document, so I should register that again. Um, but um, I'd be fine with Martin's suggestion of basically carving, um, basically dropping section four and having a focused document, and then if someone wants to produce a separate document later, but that we don't need to because we should work on four, on three, rather. Um, so I think, you know, I think, as I said, I think that like, perhaps instead of thinking of this an issue in the document, we should think about the question of what the working group wants to do. And is the working group want to work on two sets of technologies in parallel? Is the working group want to work on one set of technology, which is local discovery, and then work on the other one? And if the answer is the former, then the document should reflect that. Thank you. Ecker, Martin, please. Yeah. Um, when Paul raised the question of whether there was authenticated configuration of some form or other, I think I might be okay with, with saying that once you, uh, that you take the authentic configuration and, and leave it aside. Um, I'm also um, wondering whether we, we might need to explicitly set aside a bunch of other things like um, making sure that we don't describe um, the resolver's capability to do QName minimization or any of the other um, capabilities that, that a resolver might want to advertise so that we complicate the thing. I think it's it needs to be very specifically equivalency, and the the draft at the moment has a whole bunch of other stuff in section three about non-equivalent resolvers that we need to rule out at the same time. Thank you, Martin. Eric Nigren, please. But I think I think I'm also coming to, around to splitting out at least some of section four makes sense. Um, it may be that there's some parts of section four around the um, kind of local the local names that are core enough for the requirements and use cases that need to continue to be um, be in be in the main document but some of the others in section four seem like splitting those out to defer that separately would be better great uh, thank you eric paul hoffman is back uh, with a question so um, again, this document was titled requirements and um, what we seem to be focusing on is the, is the use cases. And in reviewing, you know, and yes, I know that there's a bunch of holes for some of the requirements, but even in the places where there weren't holes, I thought the requirements were a bit trivial, um, which is not a criticism because I think in fact, with, with well-stated use cases, the requirements fall right out. Um, does the working group want to have whatever, if, if you know, this current thread continues, does, does the working group want to um, have it be a use case, single use case document or a single requirements with use cases or whatever? I would propose let's just make it a single use case. But, but I totally get that since we're starting with a requirements document, other people might have different ideas. Thank you, Paul. Chris Box. Um, so in answer to that point, um, I think in order to create a solution, you need requirements. Um, and my aim here was to structure the 
requirements into different use cases. Um, so that, uh, hence, that's why I see this as a document that said, needs to describe n number of use cases and for each of those, um, what are the requirements that apply yeah, in order to en enable um, the solution to be developed to meet those requirements. Um, yeah, to, I'm, I did come into this expecting that we would need a fewer number of uh, use cases. Um, it was just a question of which ones. Um, so yeah, happy with that. Thank you, Jim Reed, please. Hi, I'm just going to throw something out there and be a bit provocative. Maybe it might be better to restructure this document and call it the use cases and try to capture all these use cases and then work on separate discrete requirements, documents for each of those use cases. And that would go back to deal with the issue that Eka raised earlier on about the security requirements being different, different for these scenarios. So perhaps having over, an overarching use case document and then for each specific use case, we've then got a clear requirements document that explains the issues and what to do with them. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Daniel, please. Yeah, so I think I can uh, I sort of echo um, what Chris and Jim uh, have just said. Um, uh, in some way, it's hard to provide some requirements without um, understanding the use cases. Um, but on the other hand, we are not, at, at least me, I'm not so much interested in uh, having a complete and exhaustive list of all possible use cases. Um, I think if we want to have the global picture of use cases, uh, we need to understand how they position between each other, and then th they may have some different flavor um, I mean, as long the purpose of the use case is, is rather to, not to have an exhaustive list, but to make sure that we're not missing or putting someone aside the road. So that's the reason um, use cases should be maybe abstracted a little bit. And um, I would like the focus to be on the requirements uh, for that document. OK, uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Ralph Weber, please. Uh, I think we need to work on what uh, we can agree upon the, the quickest because there is a real urge in the community out to get this problem solved. So if we can agree, say, focus use cases on three as one document and then work on the requirements for the next document and then do the solution, and that's the fastest way to get us forward, I think that's the way to go. Thank you, Ralph. Jim Reed. Thanks. Um, I think it'd be crazy to try and attempt to enumerate every potential use case. So I think we just say, is if we're going to have some sort of broad, broad, broad brush use case document, it should concentrate on the three, four, five, however many they are use cases we think are the most likely are the most credible ones. Not try to try to boil the ocean and do all of them. Find out the ones which are really going to matter, and then based on based on use case documents around that. And from there, work on individual requirements for each one. As Ralph says, we're going to try to do something which is going to be more efficiently to actually produce some useful results. Because if we just talk about this stuff, we're just going to go around and in circles and get nowhere. Thank you, Jim. Welcome back, Tommy Jensen. Thank you. So I would agree with Jim um, that we should separate uh use cases from requirements because now thinking about listening to the discussion i think there'll be a difference between use cases we think are valid and requirements documents that we think belong in this working group and it would still be important to identify use cases we agree are important even if the solution we decide doesn't does or does not belong in the working group so i'm just concurring <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Yonea san. Uh, so I'm sorry, I'm good for speaking. So I just send my thought on the Java. So yep. that the uh, requirements and the use case should be narrowed for this very simple case. And that should be uh, applications doing uh, some validation 
regarding to the uh, DNS, such as a CAA validation or DNSSEC validation. Thank you. Thank you, Yonne Song. And that is the current end of the queue. Um, I don't. Glenn, I, would, would anybody like to speak to whether we actually seem to have come to a conclusion on this issue? <laughs> Are we? I, I personally have not felt that we've gotten to some kind of consensus about how to move forward on this. Yeah, so what I've heard um, from the group is I agree with you, Dave. I don't think we've got consensus as yet. I do think, though, we've got some uh, interesting uh, suggestions that have been made back to the authors or, or to other potential authors that might want to jump in. Right. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, my sense right now is that this is something that uh, should probably be taken to the list and um, discussed a bit. And it also, uh, I would suggest, give the authors of this current uh, ID a chance to sort of process the uh, excellent input that has been um, provided here by the, all the comments and, and on the Japper. Does that seem reasonable? Yes, and I do, I would encourage also people who have commented um, that, that think they can encapsulate their comment in something relevant into the issues thread as well to capture it there, that would be very useful. Yes, that's a very good point. The issues thread is a great way to capture this on a specific question. Uh, Mr. Hoffman has joined the queue again. Um, sorry, I'm going to be a little bit whiny here, but I don't think that using the issues is correct because what we're talking about is a completely different, or what many of us are talking about, is a completely different document. So I think just discussion on the that, mailing that's list. A, that's a so fair far. point. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I... mailing list, so far, looking at what's in the issues, the, you know, the discussion in the issues, which there's been a little of, and the discussion on the mailing list, seems like the mailing list is working just fine. And I say this as not an anti-GitHub person, I say this as the person who was just made, you know, the ex-chair of the GitHub working group. But GitHub is not meant to replace active working group mailing list discussion that is about what are we working on. GitHub yeah, I, I 100... Program. Yeah, so I will say I 100% get that. And I think that, yes, that should be the overriding concern. My my initial thought about getting it captured in the issue was uh, just so that there was like a historical record documented there. But yes, I, 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 I recognize that what you're saying is m more correct, so. Maybe if I could then propose, um, maybe the, because the, I do agree with Paul as well, it's a good point. And, and, and Look, we're we're still working out. Uh, at least I, I in my own head am working out the role of the, the GitHub tool to help us do our work, which is primarily on the list and in data tracker, obviously. So maybe the the, the approach here is to have the discussion on the list, um, but then it suggests ultimately that the author is in dealing with this issue that's been opened against their draft. Um, when they resolve this issue, you know, they they, they pull it back in from the list. And, and try to document what was decided and why in this issue. Maybe that's how we do it. Because like, that maintains the historic record, but we can have the actual conversation over on the main list. Does that work for you, Paul? And, and again, you, uh, tapping your experience in that uh, working group that you, that you chaired. Absolutely. I mean, so the documents that came out of the IETF GitHub working group was for working group documents. As Ecker started this discussion a few hours ago, this isn't necessary. This is not yet a working group document. So, it, you know, whatever, however, the IETF uses GitHub, that's for working group documents. Uh, it, I, I, I think the mailing list really is. You know, there, there's, there's no advantage in GitHub here over the mailing list if we're trying to decide the structure and content of a working group document. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other comments on this particular topic? Uh, Chris would like to respond. Yeah. So I think probably the way we should go forward is we discuss it on the list, come up with 
um, some sort of answer in terms of what we would like to focus on. Um, I can then turn that into a pull request for the draft um, and generate a new draft that yeah, if, if we do it quickly enough, maybe we can discuss that at the next interim session. Okay, thank you. Which does um, uh, bring into question at the moment, and so I'm kind of jumping the queue over Clen, but at the um, our next step, so this is a, not officially a working group document, as has been pointed out. Um, the, we have been considering it uh, for bringing it to the list as, uh, especially following this meeting, about whether to adopt it as a working group document. Uh, but given its current status as not a document and questions about how we're moving forward, would the rest of the assembled uh, group here consider it to still be useful to look at other issues that have been raised? And in particular, if you think that there is still very useful discussion to be had, given some of those issues, um, speak up as to what one you might want to talk to uh, right now, because we were anticipating going a roughly another 15 minutes before we had our discussion on um, just what we hope to accomplish in session two next week. Well, and, and so let, let me jump in here um, uh, and, and suggest, so next thing that we, I propose we queue up as a discussion would be authentication. I'm looking at the time though, and I think that authentication and based upon the comments I'm seeing both on the mailing lists and in the Jabber is going to be a much bigger conversation. And so maybe um, we shouldn't tackle that one today. And maybe we should move that one as a, as a complete discussion on authentication into the next session. So maybe, so unless there's a particular topic that people want to talk about right now that can be contained, um, I'm going to propose we do authentication next session, and then we, we move right now on to discussing the format and, and the elements that people want to discuss in the next uh, interim on Tuesday. Does that make, does that work for you, Dave? Yeah. Does that work for everybody else? Any objections? Okay, I see Ecker suggesting authentication, so yes. Okay, so let me switch over then to that discussion. So the the thing we wanted to talk about was, um, hang on, why is that putting that up there? Sorry, bear with me. Uh, I, I'm dealing with the sharing of screens and WebEx, and things have changed since I last used WebEx. I've been using Teams too much, I think. Okay, let me switch what's being displayed. So the next question to talk about then is session two planning. And so we have another session like the schedule for next Tuesday, same time. And uh, the question I'll put out to the group and ask people to comment on, is in addition to authentication, what other topics would people like to uh, talk about as a priority in, during session two? So that we, when we put the agenda together, we can make sure that it's a useful and productive agenda from your, each of your perspectives. So jump in the queue and, 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 and sort of state what you would like to see, whether it's a particular draft, whether it's a particular topic, this is your chance to suggest. Uh, yes, Martin, please. I would like a short meeting, please. It's now almost one thirty in the morning. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Pauly, please. So, uh, Chris had mentioned kind of revving the doc. I, I think that should not be a goal, that we shouldn't talk about any specific documents for the next one. A lot of what was discussed today was document wise, and I don't think that much would be updated by then. I would suggest let's just focus on what does it mean to authenticate this information for discovery of local network resolvers 
um, and keep it at that. And if we finish early, we finish it. But that that particular piece of information would be very useful for guiding whatever document um, we have. Thank you, Paul Hoffman. Uh, plus one to what Tommy just said, um, although to make it a bit more difficult, um, but I think it, it is useful given what some of the, uh, when Puneet and I had started, you know, some of this well over a year ago with the Resinfo draft um, that bounced around from working group to working group, um, and now looks like it's going to bounce back to uh, DNS op because it, it's not necessarily going to be the one that's used here. Um, there is one thing that is not an agreed upon assumption in many people's mind and needs to be brought out, I think, in a use case document um, specifically is are we, um, for authentication, are we talking about authenticating with a, um, a set of trust anchors that the user already has or adding a set of trust anchors or a single trust anchor? Um, that is assuming that the that that some somewhere the user has a set of TLS trust anchors, or else DOT or DOH will never be authenticated. Are we talking about needing additional trust anchors, such as additional TLS trust anchors for the uh, uh, mechanism that's going to be used to discover, or D the trust anchors for DNSSEC, or yet a third or fourth set of trust anchors? Um, and I say the third or fourth not sarcastically because, quite frankly, um, since a lot of people did seem to care about what they called the VPN trust case, uh, the VPN case, which in this case people were talking about IPsec VPN, even though that's now a less popular VPN than TLS VPNs, um, that would be a different set of trust anchors. So I think that that would be useful for even if we're not specifying for uh, the requirements on. Uh, trust, you know, uh, what what trust anchors does the user want or need to have for the discovery mechanism? Great, thank you, Paul. Ecker? Yeah, um, so I guess, thanks, Paul, for, for bringing that up. Um, I actually think it'd be helpful to understand, like, and I don't mean, Paul, I don't mean this is a disparate draft at all, but like what do people feel is inadequate about the Resinfo draft? Because like, if you'd asked me to design something that attempted to solve these problems, like, you know, the Martin just listed in, in a Jabber, name of the local discovery ones, I would have probably designed something so like relatively similar to Resinfo. And so um, like be useful to understand like what, what constraints people think, like what other work people think to be done that isn't met by that need. Um, uh, so I think that would be, that, that, that would be helpful uh, to, to me at least. Um, uh, I think we also need to, um, this is an occasion question super fraught, but I guess we're doing it next time. Um, I, I think the other thing that I'd like to understand, and I raised this in the, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in an issue is what the network topologies that, um, you know, we expect this to work on, work in are, um, it's my impression is quite common for people to have their own, um, router between themselves and the, uh, uh, and the, and the ISP or network provided, um, uh, CPE, and so do we expect that to work? Um, and by work, I mean, um, do we expect them to like actually be able to pick up this signal? Because that's actually a pretty tight constraint of what you can and cannot do. Thank you very much, Ecker. Jim Reed, please. I was wondering if we maybe should consider that bootstrapping needs to be looked at over and above what we're talking about. Maybe it's just a, a superset of issues around authentication, but Maybe we shouldn't lose sight of that. Okay. Thank you, Jim. So that was only half a dozen people on commenting on how they think next session should go. <laughs> surely, surely there are some more opinions in this area. Glenn. Well, um, <laughs> um, I don't have an opinion. I, I'm, I'm just listening to what other people think, and then we'll try to fold that in. So that sounds pretty good. Uh, I, 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 um, I'm hearing definitely authentication will be where we'll start um, as a major topic uh, for the next section. Um, and 
as I go, I'm, I will go back and read through all the comments that just got made, as I'm sure uh, David will, and we will uh, pull out of that uh, a proposed agenda. And um, we have uh, uh, the, the chairs have a uh, a post uh, mortem of this call scheduled for tomorrow. And so uh, one of the action items for there is for us to go through that and pull together a proposed agenda, uh, and then uh, we'll post it to the list. And so that we, people have an opportunity, um, uh, and I hate to make people work over the weekend. I know it's terrible, but you know, uh, you know, t uh, over the weekend we'll get it out Friday. They can look at it Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, and then we'll again we'll meet on Tuesday. Does that sound reasonable to everybody? Because this, you know, the, I, and let me just say, you know, the, I, I very much view here uh, our role of chairs is to help guide uh, the group in its work not drive the group in, in its work. So um, this is driven by you with us trying to help facilitate that. So this is a chance to speak up and say, hey, we'd like to go a different direction, but I think we've got input from the group on that right, right now. Okay. Yeah, well, Andrew Campling would like to. It was just responding to your request for some more inputs, uh, uh, Dave. I, I just uh, uh, wanted to uh, agree with what uh, Eka just said about uh, having at least some discussion on the sort of network environments that this stuff needs to work in, because uh, I think those environments vary quite markedly um, between geographies. Um, so what's commonplace in some parts of the world won't be, be true in others. So capturing that will be useful. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, as uh, Glenn indicated, you know, mostly our, our job here is not to <laughs> declare anything by fiat. But <laughs> again, and I know, and I know, uh, Michael Richardson really did not mean that he thought we should. <laughs> um, but we just want to be clear that you know we we can help. Uh, uh, contain the discussion, but um, it, it, it's not up to Glenn and I to decide this is what has to happen next, right? This is very much, especially in, an, in this area that has um, quite a lot of um, different possible paths to, you know, to, to really help find the consensus on it. Uh, ben Schwartz, please. Schwartz. One thing I think I've noticed here is, uh, I think that some very fine details of uh, of the the network binding process and experience seem to have a lot of influence on people's thinking here. Um, so what I would appreciate in a discussion of authentication is a very concrete focus on uh, on what the experience of a user associating with a network or an IT administrator configuring a network is. Um, I think it, it would be helpful for us to strip away some of our abstractions and and you know almost try to imagine uh, like a video frame by frame. What does it look like when you connect your device to one of these networks um, in terms of the the way we do presentations and the way we discuss this topic in the next session. So, so Ben, that's a good comment. And, and I, I hope our, our, our um, uh, document uh, person captures that effectively, because I'm sure he will. Uh, <laughs> I put, I put a, a prompt in there for you. Um, so let me ask the question then, would things like, in your view, would things like maybe some um, swim diagrams be useful? Um, as, as I don't know what that is. Um, like just just protocol and direction diagrams where, where you know you start with the client having no state and then the client sh just having a, a, a diagram showing the individual interactions as, as it goes step by step through its uh, bootstrapping and through its acquisition and its selection um, so uh, I think that interactions between the technical components here are uh, are at risk of getting past the level of use cases and requirements and into protocol development. Um, the thing that I'm interested in is sort of that interaction diagram where the components are 
humans and the computers that they are interacting with. From the perspective of, of the people involved in the system, what does what is the apparent behavior of of the system? Okay. Um, I, as a concrete example, I think that one of the one of the things that I, I think we have has generated confusion here is that some people imagine that connecting to a network would generate a certain kind of prompt. And some people imagine it, that it wouldn't generate a prompt or that it would generate some other kind of prompt. The exact question of what the user sees and what that flow looks like it has a lot of impact on what it means to be authenticated or unauthenticated. Okay, thanks, Ben. Yeah, and and and, 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 I, and I, I'll I, capture your own comments there because I think that was especially salient. So I trust it'll make it into the and um, into the notes. Yeah, I, I was going. I, I echo that. Um, good comments, and so good to have it captured. Anyone else? I think we've probably. It looks like we've reached the point where we'll actually manage to end uh, ten minutes early as uh, Glenn and Barry and I take it to uh, figure out how the next session is going to work. Yeah. So um, here, here's the. Just to remind you, um, next session is the same time, thirteen hundred to fifteen thirty GMT. Uh, it's September fifteenth, which is next Tuesday. No registration is required. Uh, the meeting link is available in Data Tracker, um, so just go there and you can download. It. And we've also emailed it to the group uh, several times, so uh, I think you'll be able to find your way there quite successfully. Uh, and as always, if uh, people uh, have suggestions on how to better use these tools, uh, please uh, drop myself and, and Dave a note uh, through the ADD chairs uh, at itf.org mailing list. Uh, we are learning as we go. So uh, if you have experience you can share to help improve things, always welcome. So thank you. And with that, I think we're, we're going to call it a, a meeting, Dave. Yeah, I think that's a good place to close. Thank you, everybody. And, and may I just comment that um, I really do appreciate how patient uh, and professional everyone's been and respectful uh, to everyone on this conversation. I think it's um, been a very, very good session for that. Great. And people are already dropping off Jabber, so I think they've already checked out Martin's heading to bed. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Stop the recording. Yes, I will. One second.